So, uh, good evening, uh, ladies and gentlemen, and thank you all very much for coming along. I'm slightly worried they're going to start showing the film, so uh, I'll keep my, uh, my uh, discussion uh, fairly focused. So, uh, this is the first of a series of um, events where uh, Queen Mary, your uh, friendly neighbourhood university, is going to be working with the Genesis and putting on short talks before uh, feature films, uh, depending on the, the topic of that. So if there's a historical film comes out, we'll have some from the history department. And if a robot -y thing comes out, it'll be me. So uh, just to introduce yourself, myself, I'm Peter McCown. I'm a professor of computer science. I actually work up in the, the, the university. I'm particularly interested in artificial intelligence and, uh, oh, thank you, uh, artificial intelligence and social robotics. How do we begin to uh, build robots such that uh, they're able to understand something about how to interact with us in extended, uh, socially meaningful uh, interactions. Um, I'm also, I should point out before we start this, a really gigantic fan of science fiction movies and science fiction TV shows. It's the thing that made me want to become uh, a scientist. Um, so as I go through this and tell you what my personal views are on the topic of whether or not robots will take over the world, uh, I feel kind of curmudgeonly, a bit like a, a parent telling you to not read under the duvet with a torch on because it's terribly bad for your eyes. I, I love science fiction, and as I say, uh, it's fantastic to be able to watch them and to be entertained with them uh, in the, the same way that uh, I hope that uh, you will be when the, the, the movie comes on. When I was younger, I saw myself very much as a kind of Time Lord version of Tony Stark, and so I'm hoping that... Uh, Although I'm going to come over rather technical in places, it's not for want of a love for the genre. So the question that I'm most frequently asked uh, when I'm out doing talks is, uh, will robots take over the world? And uh, again, the, the movie we're going to see tonight is another fantastic example of, uh, well, spoiler alert, robots taking over the world. So one of the things that I think is particularly important to, to realise there is that films are films, and films need a narrative which has got conflict in it, and that's what we all enjoy. And particularly if you look at Western cinema um, and Western television, it tends to be that robots are seen as very often the, the evil villains uh, of the piece. And that's actually to do a lot with the culture in, 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 uh, in the West. If you look at uh, Japanese cinema, for example, robots are very frequently seen as, as the heroes uh, in television shows. I remember Gigantor, the space age robot, when I was much younger, uh, a Japanese cartoon series, and the robot in that was, was friendly and helpful. And in part, that's to do with the Judeo-Christian uh, tradition of the West, where uh, things other than human beings tend not to have a soul, whereas Shinto religion in Japan, uh, other things can have souls. So there's a kind of uh, interesting cultural division, and robots aren't necessarily seen as, as villainous um, uh, across the, the globe. Um, so what I thought would be useful to, to do this evening was to, to try and get you to think a little bit about the, about the why. Uh, a lot of movies about the how robots are going to take over the world, the various twists and turns and uh, the ability that they have to, to do fantastic and wonderful things, which certainly uh, they, they can do. Uh, but the question of, of, of motivation, I think, is an important one. And uh, I thought that it would be useful to, to take another thing from a, a recent movie, The Imitation Game, which was about the computer scientist Alan Turing. And Turing put forward a very famous test. And that test, the, the Turing test, which bears his name, was to try and understand something about uh, a, an artificial intelligence, basically a system that you build specifically to mimic uh, something that you would call intelligent. How, the, how that intelligence could be assessed to have uh, actually kind of made it to the point where it was believable. And so in the original Turing test, uh, it was based around conversation. You would have uh, somebody sitting at a teletype typing in questions, and those questions would either, either be answered by a real person in another room or by a computer in another room. And if you couldn't tell whether or not you were talking to a real person or to a, a, a computer, an artificial intelligence, then it was deemed that the computer program had passed the Turing test. Now, the useful thing about that is that, first of all, conversation is actually a socially meaningful level of interaction that, you, that you're having. It's something that we see as being intelligent. The content of conversations are seen as being intelligent. But also, once you have a system that can kind of pass that test, 
you can then go in and you can have a look at the various elements that you've had to encode explicitly into that computer program to try and understand something about potentially the way that human beings operate. So the ability of, the, the, of a conversational AI to be able to pass the Turing test would need uh, some understanding about the semantics of things, verbs, nouns, and so on. Um, and uh, uh, and that, that's an important part of, of how that would work. So you could kind of pick it apart. So a, a thought experiment that came to me just when thinking about this was, is there a Turing test for world domination? So world domination is socially meaningful because you know if, if you are saying X is, is ruling the world, then obviously that has kind of social impacts on you. So one of the questions then would be, um, if you were able to, to see a, a world ruled, how would you know if that world was being ruled by, uh, by human beings or by robots? And in kind of picking through the, 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 the rules and regulations around world domination, it's possibly interesting to get an idea of what those robots and those artificial intelligence would actually need to be doing, would need to have in the way of motivations to be able to, to, to run um, on that particular uh, a particular kind of scheme of things. And I jotted down a couple of ideas about the sorts of things that, uh, that you might want to do. So um, the sorts of things that the robots would want to do would be to control our lives. Uh, so if, if, if somebody's ruling the world, they're controlling our lives. But then I was thinking about it. Well, actually, if you're applying for a credit card these days, chances are that you'll be accepted or declined actually by, uh, by an artificial intelligence. It does credit scoring and decides whether or not you get that credit card. And, Having a credit card could be you know, seen as actually controlling your life. Uh, obviously, things like the stock market. A lot of the, uh, the stock shares, stocks and share trading is done through automated AI systems that are programmed to look for particular patterns and data. And how those, are, how those change actually changes the, the costs of things and can also impact on, on people's lives. So in a way, artificial intelligences are in some parts actually controlling our life and, and what we're, we're doing. Um, another thing I thought, just kind of pulling it out there, was uh, ordering us around. That's another thing that, uh, that, that, uh, that robots ruling the world would do, obviously, because they'd be fairly rough and tough and mechanical and rather mean to us. But then if you consider the uh, unexpected, bag uh, pack unexpected item in the packing area uh, coming from, from tills and supermarkets, they're ordering you around. They're saying, no, that's not right. Go back and put that back in again. So potentially, you know, we already have uh, robots ordering us around in ways that we possibly hadn't thought of before. You know, not big screen stuff, but kind of small local supermarket type stuff. Um, again, the idea that robots would somehow be higher in the pecking order than we were. But interestingly enough, if you look at how robots are being used in the manufacturing industry, and they're being used there a lot, there was some recent research done by MIT where uh, people were asked whether or not they preferred to uh, be in charge of the scheduling of the work that was happening or have that work scheduled for them by, by a robot. And uh, a large number, a lot, the, the larger percentage of people in there actually enjoyed being told what to do by the robot. Now, I don't know what that tells us about the people that they got involved in the study. Or, uh, or, or, the, or the research at MIT, but it's interesting that you would kind of feel uh, that that would, that would be some, an area where you might feel disturbed, but certainly in a work situation, uh, they're, they're picking, picking up on that. And then finally, the um, other area where obviously it kind of crops up time and again is that uh, if whatever was ruling the world, it would want to kill us. And um, sadly, robots can do that, and there are cases of people who've been um, accidentally killed by uh, wandering into the kind of protected areas around industrial robots and so on. Uh, but there are also potentially situations where we have used um, artificial intelligence and drones, and those drones in, in warfare conditions have actually been used and have actually caused deaths in there. But each of those, as I was kind of going through it, was, was just part of a kind of larger jigsaw. Uh, each element of it was uh, a particular place where robots had done something that could be called world dominating. But actually, if you try to squeeze all those pieces together to get the larger picture, I don't think it's there just yet. So if you're thinking about the, the aspects of, of how, how you build these uh, and create these robotic systems that are going to, in, in some way, be able to, to, to rule us and control the world, 
I think you want to think about uh, motives and opportunities because that's exactly the kind of things that uh, very frequently uh, we think about when uh, trying to identify the culprit uh, in, in various murder mysteries. And certainly when it comes to opportunities, uh, artificial intelligence and robotics have tremendous uh, opportunities which we as human beings don't have. Uh, intelligence at some fundamental level is about recognizing patterns in data. As a human being, I bring in sensory data through my five senses. I look for patterns in that and I associate those particular patterns with particular motor outputs. So I don't put my hand into, into a hot flame uh, because I recognize hot flameness and, uh, and make the, the removal of my hand from there. And so it's possible to build robots that can learn in the same way that our little gray cells are able to adapt and strengthen depending on the conditions and the experiences that we've had. Equally well, you can take uh, uh, little electronic transistors and you can adapt those. So robots and artificial intelligence can learn, but learning in and of itself is not necessarily uh, a threat to humanity. Anyone who goes to school is learning and they're not necessarily wanting to take over the world. So the question then is around this, this opportunity aspect to it. We've got these possibilities of these learning systems and they can dig down into deep data uh, in a way that we as human beings can't and they can process that data very, very quickly. So there are a whole series of different forms of data that we leave kind of trailing around us as we wander through the world these days, which we as human beings are oblivious to, but artificial intelligence systems might not be. And we already have systems that are working on these kinds of things to look at kind of consumer profiles and so on, to be able to offer you um, bargain, uh, bargains down at the, at the supermarket and so on. So the opportunities there and the ability for robots to be able to process these kinds of bits of data that we, that we didn't have before. And there is the possibility that you could begin to see how robots in kind of small sections could start to be able to process information in, in a particular way. And if somehow they managed to join together in cohorts, it could become a little bit more sinister. So uh, a system that analyzes your shopping habits and another AI system, for example, that's monitoring your fitness levels and uh, gives you a, a little nudge on your, your Fitbit well, when you're doing well and posts something onto Facebook that says, I've done a 200 mile run on my Nike Pluses or whatever. If those systems were somehow to be able to combine one another, you could get a situation where the uh, requirement to, to make you healthier interfaces with the ability to check what you're buying. And so you get a system that doesn't allow you to buy beer at the supermarket. Those are the kinds of things that, have, again, the idea of lots of different artificial intelligences kind of combining together have been used in movies. But actually, in reality, that's incredibly difficult to do. Those systems are very different from one another, they're very distributed from one another. And the opportunity of having some kind of shared understanding, some shared data structures between them uh, is, is not really going to happen by accident. It will happen if people design it, if people wish to, to produce those kinds of things. And in and of themselves, I don't think that, that artificial intelligences would have a motivation to take over the world. What would the motivation to take over the world be? Would it be, as is often the case, that uh, it's about survival? Um, that humanity rises up against its robot overlords. Well, for that, first of all, the robots need to rise up as overlords. And they're an integral part of our society these days. Um, they build our cars, they build our smartphones. They're in our smartphones. I have a piece of artificial intelligence in there. I have artificial intelligence in uh, the ability to play an MP3 track, for example, because that contains a little computer model of the way our brain hears sound but I also have Siri on this, which again is able to understand some of the, the language that I'm using. And this in and of itself is not going to take over the world. Um, it's part of our, our society. So I, I wouldn't have thought that we would necessarily feel that you were, um, you were being threatened as an artificial intelligence because of the fact that we actually, as a society, are a blend between the technologies that we produce and as, as human beings. And robots do things very well that human beings don't do, but humans do things well that robots don't do. So I don't think the motivation is necessarily there for it to, for it to happen. Um, so ultimately, at the end of it, I would guess that if somebody asks me the questions, will robots take over the world? My answer to that would be yes, 
but only if we let them, because I do think that this likelihood that somehow this kind of great snowballing effect is going to occur where uh, every single piece of AI on a Google platform starts to be able to talk to every piece of AI on an Apple platform and so on. Without human intervention in that, it's going to be a problem. So if uh, extraterrestrials come down and add a certain pecans to the mix, well, that's a slightly different situation and I'm sure uh, our friends on the screen will tell us about that. But at the end of the day, I think that um, that robots and artificial intelligence are actually part of this blend that we as humanity have, where they are, they are useful and they contribute to our society and aren't necessarily the threat that we very often see them as being. And part of the reason we see that threat is because of this kind of layer uh, on top of, of, of the, the reality of the situation, which is, is carried by that kind of uh, race narrative of robots being cruel and evil. But then again, I could be wrong. Um, so at that point, uh, I'm going to say uh, thank you very much for your attention. And if we had any brief single question at the end, then uh, do we have time for that? Yeah, we have time for a question. Okay, so are there any questions? No? Silence, yes. Um, what's your take on the recent alleged So the, the Turing test, the Lubner Prize, which is probably what you're alluding to, um, is set up uh, as a fairly substantial cash prize. It's to pass the, uh, the, the, the conversational Turing test on that. And uh, last year, there was, a, was it last year or the year before that, um, there, was, there was a big, big blast of publicity about the fact that a, a computer program had passed that. Um, when you looked at, looked at it in a little bit more detail, uh, actually the artificial intelligence that passed that had also passed itself off as, I think, a 12-year-old Ukrainian boy, which allowed it to do certain things like answer in very strange and contorted sorts of ways. So to an extent, if you consider uh, that as, as passing a test, then it has passed the test. But I would say that it still doesn't... Uh, and in the, the, the Lubner Prize, I think it needs to fool one-third of the judges rather than all of them. 100% over an extended period of time. So again, it's just part of that jigsaw. It's just a little piece of the jigsaw rather than, than a wider thing. But if you think about it, actually processing language information is incredibly difficult for, for computers and AIs to do because we use the, the syntax, the way of putting things together, and that can fairly easily be broken down. The semantics is very different. So my favorite example, which I'll finish with, is I didn't steal grandmother's chocolate cake. So that's the syntax of it. And then if you just listen to the stress that I put on different parts of that, each time it will completely change its meaning. I didn't steal grandmother's chocolate cake. It was someone else. I didn't steal grandmother's chocolate cake. Emphatically, it wasn't me. I didn't steal grandmother's chocolate cake. I kind of borrowed it. I was going to give it back. I didn't steal grandmother's chocolate cake. She must have mislaid it. I didn't steal grandmother's chocolate cake. It was anti flows. I didn't steal grandmother's chocolate cake. It was a vanilla sponge. I didn't steal grandmother's chocolate cake. It was a chocolate biscuits. So as you can see, in each one of those, there is just a, just a little bit of a nuance on that and something which mechanically is exactly the same set of, of, of words joined together means something completely different. And that is actually very challenging for a, a, an artificial intelligence system to, to work on. And clearly, you really would need that to, to pass a more general test. OK, I'm being told that they're about to start the film. So I've been Peter. You've been fantastic. Thank you very much. Enjoy the movie.